our mouse. And I guess uh, the key to all of this is, if you're thinking about Down syndrome, it may seem rather bizarre to even want to make a mouse model in the first place. Um, some of you may find that extremely strange, because I guess this is a pretty mixed audience, and um, perhaps not everybody is used to thinking about mouse models for human disease. But when you catch the tube across London later tonight, and you're watching all those mice scuttle around on the station in front of you, remember that they're related to us. They're actually not that far distant cousins. All living things are related to one another, and we're separated from mice by a mere 80 million years, which is a sort of blink of an eye, in, uh, at least in geological time. So we're all related to each other. We all share the same genomes, the same collection of genes. And those genes are actually doing pretty much the same thing in all of us. So although things like physiology, lifespan, size can be different um, and can play very significant roles, from the point of view of a geneticist, and I'm a geneticist, working with mice is almost pretty similar to really working with humans. But obviously, there are, there are, mice are somewhat more tractable um, as experimental animals. So remember that, we're working with mice because genetically we're pretty much the same as a mouse. And so that means that whatever disorders we suffer from as humans, you can find exactly the same thing or create exactly the same thing in mice. And they're a much more tractable system to then study experimentally. And I also just want to add in the proviso, um, all the work that I'm going to present is not about curing Down syndrome. I mean, we don't cure Down syndrome, that would be like trying to cure me of my inability to sing or my desire to eat Marmite in the morning. What this is about is about teasing out which individual genes on chromosome 21 cause different aspects of the phenotype. And why do we want to do that? Because if we know about those genes, genes give instructions to the cell. They say, put a bit of protein there or take that bit of protein away. If we can work out what the instructions are that are different in Downs compared to the rest of us, that's a route for therapy for that particular aspect of Down syndrome, whether it's leukemia or the autoimmune diseases or whatever. So we really want to use the mouse model to dissect out, to tease apart which genes are responsible for which aspects of Down syndrome. And all this work um, that I'm going to whip through in the next 10 minutes is done uh, completely in collaboration with my friend and, in fact, ex-flatmate, Viktor Tabulovic, who's a, a lab head up at the National Institute for Medical Research in Mill Hill. Um, and because I didn't know until 1.30, I think, this afternoon that I was actually going to be giving a talk now, this is um, a very rapidly modified talk, and there's a lot of technical stuff at the end, which I'll just skim through very quickly. So let's start. A bit of history. Um, you all know this much better than I do. John Langdon Down, uh, English physician with an unusual for those days interest in uh, people with learning difficulties. A uh, man of very liberal views. The early suffragettes, it turns out, met in his home because he was a great uh, believer in education for women, obviously a good man. And I'm giving you some historical perspective just to show you how damn hard it is to tease out the genetics of this syndrome, and I'll explain why. So 1862, in a monograph, he described what we now know as Down syndrome, or Down's syndrome in the UK. Nothing very much then happened for about 100 years, till 1959, when Jérôme Lejeune, who was a French doctor working in Paris, found that Down syndrome arises principally because one has an extra copy of human chromosome 21. So most of us have 46 chromosomes, as you all know. People with Down syndrome have an extra copy of chromosome number 21. And what we can say, and um, pretty well from, from 1959, really until very recent years, is we could say, all right, then Down syndrome is very common. One in 750 or so live births around the world is a child with Down syndrome. If we think about how the syndrome uh, shakes down into different clinical features, if you like, as you know, there are what we call the invariant features. This includes the hypotonia, the, the floppy baby, the learning difficulties, and then there are at least 80 different variable features that have been described that include very commonly specific types of heart defects, um, the, the Alzheimer's-like pathology, autoimmune diseases, leukemias, et cetera, et cetera, across the board. But many, many different um, systems affected. And it's different in everybody who has Downs. And there are probably quite good genetic reasons for that, but we don't know what they are. So here's a reminder. Remember what genes do. All they do is they just give instructions to the cells. There's nothing more complicated than that. Um, and of course, we're all made of cells. So the genes just give instructions as to what we're like uh, in many respects. 
So Down syndrome, it's, it's such a tough genetic nut to crack because unlike many other human disorders, we're not looking for mutated genes. We're not looking for abnormal genes. Everybody who has Down syndrome has normal genes like the rest of us. There's nothing abnormal about them. But what's different is the dosage. And this is what makes it so difficult. We, we normally, we spend all our lives in genetics research trying to find mutant genes. We can't use any of the techniques that we've built up over the last 100, 120 years of, of really hardcore genetics research because they won't work in Downs. So we're left with this issue. Why does Down syndrome arise? Well, okay, you know it arises because you have an extra chromosome 21, but we want to look a little bit more closely than that. Which genes are responsible for the different aspects of Down syndrome? And this really sums up um, the last 50 years or so, since 1959, the last 46 years, of um, human studies. It's quite difficult to look at human genetics in people who have Down syndrome because what we can really say is most people have an extra copy of chromosome 21. Okay, that doesn't get us much further. There are rare cases, and over the last 46 years or so, probably about 90 have been described, maybe less than that, of people who have partial trisomy 21. They're just trisomic for a little bit of the chromosome, not the whole thing. And you can immediately see that if you've got a little bit of the chromosome and then you look at the clinical feature of that person, that you might be able to make correlations between where the genes are on the chromosome and what occurs in terms of what we call the phenotype, the, the clinical appearance, if you like, of that individual. So people have done that over the years. And very broadly, we can say that this is um, chromosome 21, magnificently drawn, as you can see. There's the centromere. That's just the, the, um, the, the bit that sort of holds the chromosome together. And this is what we call the long arm for the obvious reason because this is what we call the short arm. So what people have vaguely been able to say is that near this little region of DNA that's called D21S55, that, that's just a name uh, um, for a bit of DNA, near that bit of DNA on the long arm there, there seem to be genes that are important for the invariant features, the learning disabilities and the hypotonia, but we don't know what those genes are. So we've just done a bit of mapping, which is what geneticists love to do, and we've just positioned a few genes on the long arm of 21. And that's it, for pretty well that's it for human genetic studies, um, at least with respect to the whole chromosome. So people started thinking about mouse models, and much work of this um, has been done over the years. Johns Hopkins particularly has just been mentioned, the, the University in Baltimore in the States have done a lot of work on mouse models, Roger Rees particularly being a, a star of this. For, for those of you who know about um, genes, I'm not going to go into any great degree of detail here, but there have been many mouse models where people have put in abnormal doses of single individual genes. There are problems with that um, because the dose itself is important. Um, I won't go into detail about this. But the other problem that we have is that although mice, cows, yaks, elephants, fish, your favorite animal, ants, contain pretty well the same genes that we do, our chromosomes are not the same. They're all scrambled up. So genes on human chromosome 21 are present on three different mouse chromosomes. And I'm just giving you some notation here. HSA, Homo sapiens, that just means human chromosome 21. MMU refers to mus musculus, that's the Latin name for a mouse. So we're just saying human chromosome 21 has genes present on mouse chromosome 16, mouse 17, and mouse 10, three different chromosomes in the mouse. So that means if we have a mouse that's trisomic, say for chromosome 16, it's actually not a particularly good model for Down syndrome because firstly, it's only got a few of the genes that are on chromosome 21, and secondly, it's then got lots of other genes that are on mouse chromosome 16 that are trisomic that have nothing to do with Down syndrome. But nevertheless, uh, I just want to point out two very, very, very important mouse models. They're known as TS65DN and TS1CJE. That's just the name for the strain of mouse. These mouse are trisomic. They have three copies of these genes here from mouse chromosome 16. There's mouse chromosome 16 there. And that corresponds to this region of human chromosome 21 here. That includes the genes from the Down syndrome critical region. And we've learned an awful lot um, from those mice, and particularly Charles Epstein at the University of uh, California in San Francisco, Roger Reeves at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, have really worked up these mouse models. So what have they told us? Well, I want to give you one example, and this is my plug for the value of mouse models. When Roger Reeves started looking at the cerebellum, which is a little bit of your brain at the back that controls fine motor control, um, such as being able to play the piano, for example, 
When he looked at the number of neurons in the cerebellum, in that mouse, he found that the number of neurons, the number of nerves, was reduced compared to normal animals with a normal chromosome number. So they then went back and they looked at the cerebellum in people with Down syndrome, and lo and behold, they found that there is a reduced number of neurons in the cerebellum of people with Down syndrome as well. Now, that would not have been seen without looking at the mouse. So in a way, it's not surprising because we are very closely related to mice. So if you have a genetic defect in a mouse, it's telling you an awful lot about what goes on in humans. And this is the whole reason, of course, that we work with mice. So some years ago, uh, Victor and I um, started thinking about, well, you know, maybe we could, we could overcome some of these genetic problems by creating a different type of model of Down syndrome. And we were quite staggeringly naive when we started this, as I'll, I'll come on to show you. But we thought, well, all right, why don't we try and put human chromosome 21, just take this whole whopping great long stringy chromosome and put it into a mouse. And if we can do that, then we've got the full set of correct genes being trisomic. That will give us our mouse model. And we've got the full complicated genetic interplay that's going on between those genes and the rest of the genes in the mouse genome. So just to uh, summarize what we did, um, I have to point out, when I started this project, I was 32. I am now 46, and it took all that time to actually get this work published. So this is not short-term work. And the funding of this, Peter, is a bloody nightmare, so please give us some money. <laughs> so what we did, we, um, we took human chromosome 21 out of a normal cell, and we did a bunch of things, which I'm not going to go into detail about, and we put it into a mouse embryonic stem cells. Now, embryonic stem cells may sound new, perhaps, to most of you, but actually, mouse embryonic stem cells have been knocking around for about 20 years, in fact, well over 20 years. We've been working with them for over 20 years. And the reason we work with embryonic stem cells is because, as you know, they will form lots of other, well, really any other tissue in a mouse. So we take our embryonic stem cell, we put human chromosome 21 into it, and then using absolutely standard techniques that people have been using since the late 1980s at least, we then take these cells and we inject them into a very, very early embryo. This is what's called a pre-implantation embryo. It's just a few days old. It's so young that it hasn't yet implanted into the uterus of the mother. So we, we put these embryos back into foster mother mice. They implant. This, this is exactly like human IVF techniques, except we wouldn't be doing embryonic stem cell work. Pop those back into a mouse, and what's born is an animal that contains the cell line. It's partly made up of the cell line carrying the human chromosome. We then breed from that animal, and uh, this just shows you the cell line that goes into that animal. You can't see it terribly well, but the red blobs are mouse chromosomes. Uh, this um, sort of fluorescent green number, that's human chromosome 21. So that's what we've put into these mice. We put in a normal mouse cell line carrying now a human chromosome. And what we get out are mice that transmit the human chromosome from one generation to the next. And as you can see, they're not Frankenstein mice. Less than 1% of their genome is actually human. So this is, I don't think it's transcending any particularly startling ethical boundaries, despite what you may have read in The Guardian. And they look pretty well like normal mice. I, I've been working for mice for 20 years. If I looked at these animals, I actually couldn't tell any difference from the mice that you're going to see on the tube station tonight at Russell Square. We call them transchromosomic mice. It's just a long word for saying these mice have an extra uh, chromosome, which happens to be human chromosome 21. They look completely normal, but they contain about 90% of all the genes on human chromosome 21. For reasons I, I won't go into, but I will if anybody's interested, there are a couple of small gaps in the chromosome. Um, and they contain overall about 90% of the entire length of human chromosome 21. So that's all very well and good. We've made these mice. Um, first question, you want to know if you're a geneticist, do they express human genes? So this is just all technical stuff. For those of you who perhaps are familiar with looking at genes, this is the kind of stuff you do to see our genes expressed. This is a list of genes from human chromosome 21, and all the genes on the, that list are expressed in the right place at the right time. So the genes on 21, human 21, in those mice, are giving the appropriate messages, are giving the appropriate instructions that they would in a human cell to the mouse cells. So you then want to know, well, OK, we've got the chromosome in. We're getting genes expressed properly. What's the effect on the mouse? Are we actually managing to model at a, at a more clinical level, if you like, what you'd perhaps see in human Down syndrome? And we think the answer is yes. So this is work that's been done in collaboration with lots of other specialist labs. Uh, no one is allowed to ask me a question about this because I don't understand it. But in fact, Bill will, because this is his area of expertise. 
But this is a, a measurement of um, electro, electrical activity, electrophysiological activity in the brain of our mice down here compared to their normal littermates, their littermates that don't carry the chromosome 21. And you can see that there's a clear difference in activity. If you then do um, tests of learning and memory, which relate back to that electrophysiological activity you've just seen, then we can also say that in our TC1 mice, compared to their litter mates, their brothers and sisters that don't carry that extra chromosome, then there is a deficit in learning and memory. So the, the mice do have a deficit in learning and memory, and that we are, maybe might be able to tease out an electrophysiological reason for that. Remember that cerebellum neuron number stuff I was just telling you about that um, is found to be reduced in TS65DN mouse, the, the main mouse model that people have been working with up till now, and in people who have Down syndrome, well, it's also reduced. The number of neurons in this little bit of the brain down here are also reduced in RTC1 mice. So again, we're, we're recapitulating what's found in Down syndrome and in our other mouse models. And I think a, a very important aspect to this model is uh, we're not only looking in the brain, we're looking elsewhere. So if we look, uh, these are cross-sections of um, TC1 mouse heart, and these are cross-sections of their normal litter mates, and we're seeing exactly the same deficits in these mice in the hearts that you see in about 40% of individuals who have Down syndrome. And this just reminds me to say, of course, this research helps us understand about Down syndrome, but we all get these sorts of deficits, albeit to a much reduced extent. And so what we learn about Down syndrome is helping the rest of the population as well, if we can work out what's going wrong with the genes, what is happening with these instructions, and how we can ameliorate their effects. So finally, uh, we also looked at uh, craniofacial differences. So this is a mouse skull, and um, Paul Sharp, who works over at King's, took various different measurements of the skull in our mouse, and we did find some differences in our mice compared to their normal litter mates, which again recapitulates what's been found by Roger Reeves in the TS65 DN mouse, and also what one, uh, starting to recapitulate what one can find in Downs as well. So we're going on uh, with the help of funding, and I have to say a very, very, very big thank you indeed to Bill Mobley, who's just helped us get uh, an extremely important grant on this, which we would not have got without Bill's help. Um, so thank you very much, Bill. Um, but we're going on to, to look at other aspects of Down syndrome in these mice. And again, this is all about teasing out the pathways, working out the genes, because in the very long term, we want to be able to modulate the instructions that are coming from the genes, the extra copy of of the genes on chromosome 21. So, almost finally, um, the mouse recapitulates the features of human Down syndrome. Well, thank God, after spending 14 years working on it, I'm glad it does. It gives us a way in which pretty well all the genes on chromosome 21 are present in three copies in that mouse, so it gets around a whole lot of problems that we would have if we just worked with classical mouse genetics. But this is the point. It allows genetic studies. We can now work with this mouse to focus down on individual genes, and we can do that using mouse genetics techniques that we've had for many, many years that are very standard. There's nothing new in the technology that we can now start to bring to bear on these animals. But a proviso, because with biology, it's never as simple as it first looks. There's always a proviso. And Roger Reeves and his colleagues in a, in a paper in 2004 have already pointed out that for at least the features they've looked at, there is not a simple one-to-one -one relationship between a single gene on chromosome 21 and the specific aspects of the syndrome that they happen to be looking at. So for some aspects, there will be a one-to-one -one simple relationship. For some, there won't. We'll wait and see what, how that works out. Um, why this, uh, this particular mouse is important is because, well, firstly, if you're not interested in Downs, this is proof of principle for other chromosomal abnormalities, and there are many, many of those around. Um, secondly, because, uh, as you've already heard this afternoon, trisomy 21 is very important in terms of um, numbers of live births. It's also incredibly important in terms of number of spontaneous abortions. And chromosome abnormalities across the board are now... Uh, account for at least 5%, 5% of all recognized, clinically recognized conceptions. And in fact, if one could look earlier, um, it would probably be rather more than that. And we don't actually know why having an abnormal chromosome number is so deleterious. We don't know why it's so bad for you. So finally, I just want to point out some very important labs who, who, who may be of interest to those of you who work on different aspects of Downs. Um, this is me, and I work at the Institute of Neurology. Victor 
my collaborator and erstwhile flatmate who works at the MRC National Institute for Medical Research, Dan Lizatek, who's over at Barts and QMW, who works on gene expression, Paul Sharp, who's at Guy's Kings, who works on the craniofacial deficits, Deborah Henderson, who's in Newcastle, who's the heart expert, Tim Bliss, uh, who's <coughs> also at the National Institute for Medical Research, who works on LTP, the, that's the electrophysiological measures in the brain, and Sebastian Brantner, who's a neuropathologist who works at the MRC Prion Unit at UCL. And I think I've now used up, ooh, 14 minutes of Bill's time, so thank you. <laughs>